Welcome to Pushback Talks. This week's episode focuses on China, a country most known for the size of its population, for state repression and abuse of human rights, and as a manufacturing giant. What's less known about China is that it's a country obsessed with real estate. The government has used it to drive economic growth, and a huge portion of the population stores its wealth there. We're joined by Dexter Roberts, the former China bureau chief and Asia News editor for Bloomberg. Dexter explains the Evergrande debacle that's been in the headlines for months now. Evergrande is China's second largest real estate developer and the world's most indebted, owing hundreds of billions of dollars and with more than a million apartments purchased but not built. Many fear that if Evergrande collapses, we'll see a repeat of the global financial crisis of 2008. And so the big question is, can China's Communist Party save capitalism? I'm Frederick Gerten, and I'm the filmmaker. And I'm Leilani Farha, and I'm the advocate. And this is Pushback Talks, and this is like the last episode of the year of 2021. It's like our third season coming to its end, Leilani. This is our pandemic project. It is our pandemic project, and uh, we've been going at it. No resources, but having lots of fun covering lots of topics. That's why we have this Patreon. So if people want to support the podcast, you can actually find a way to do that. We will tell you more later on. But now, now we're going to go somewhere we haven't been. Somewhere big. And that's China. And when it's China, it's big. And if it's China and housing, it's even bigger. And then we've read these stories about Evergrande, this really big company. It's one of the biggest companies in China. And they have some huge financial problems. I think they have like sold 2 million apartments that they haven't built yet. And then they are sitting on the stock of empty apartments and they can't pay the bills. So how do we do in pushback talks to talk about this? We invite somebody who knows more than us. So (laughs) we're going to talk to Dexter Roberts and he has been the China bureau chief and Asia news editor at Bloomberg Business Week. He was based in Beijing for more than two decades. He won tons of awards for his work. And he recently wrote a book called The Myth of Chinese Capitalism, which was released in the year of the pandemic 2020. So we really want to know more from Dexter. But first, welcome to Pushback Talks, Dexter. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. We told you just before that I, Leilani sits in her basement in Ottawa. Normally, I'm at my office in Malmo, but now I'm actually in Rio, Brazil, because I am on my way to a film shoot in, in Chile. But you are not in China. You are somewhere in a snowy place. That's right. I am uh, left China uh, a little bit before the pandemic uh, in uh, about three years ago. I'm now in Missoula, Montana, in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, after a, a, a winter with very little snow, we now have quite a bit of snow. So you and Leilani can talk about the snow and I can talk about the beach. Is that a, is that a good deal? <laughs> but, but Dexter, what is this Evergrande story? Why, why is Evergrande shaking risks to shake the Chinese economy and, uh, and, and the world economy? Well, uh, I mean, one of the first things that you need to understand about the Chinese economy is the degree to which it is reliant on real estate to drive economic growth. Uh, most estimates put about uh, a third of the economy in some way being related to the property sector. Um, and the other thing to know about uh, China's economy and, and, and also the property sector is it's very, very indebted. They've built up huge amounts of debt from years, more than a decade of high levels of investment. And they're starting to get very worried about this. So, uh, yeah, the property sector is the most indebted part of the economy, and the government has decided that that's not good for long-term growth. Can, can I just stop you there? Because I'm already a bit mind-blown. Did you notice, Leilani, that one-third of the Chinese economy is real estate? I did. I, I, I wrote it down. We know China from producing tons of stuff that we consume. Uh, but this is uh, real estate is, of course, for internal uh, use in some way. So, Dexter, this is the this is in and what does it mean that this big part of the Chinese economy is real estate? Well, uh, from China's perspective, um, it means that uh, there's a great de- a great degree of instability in the economy. Um, they also not only do they rely a lot on, on real estate, but real estate is 
um, uh, they, 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 they build more real estate than they actually need. So we have a, an issue with upwards of 20% of apartments, for example, being vacant in China. Um, there is, most people do own their, do have their own homes, but there's also a lot more that actually aren't even filled yet. And this, this is a problem. So the Chinese housing crisis is a backward one. There is, or we, are we reading some numbers? I don't know how to check them, but that between 60 and 90 million empty apartments in China, it sounds insane. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very large number. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, because your average Chinese person doesn't have a lot of uh, investment opportunities, uh, the, the capital accounts in the economy are closed, there's not a lot of investment elsewhere, uh, a full, I think it's 90% of household wealth is put into their house is put into housing so um, a lot of people have more than one apartment um, and uh, this has been fine because real estate values have gone up for years and years as long as they keep going up everybody's happy the Chinese government's happy because the economy keeps growing and the Chinese people are happy because their uh, their savings keep going up and that, mm. that, that that the fear is that that will change we, we Leila, have been talking about capitalism on steroid, steroids when we talk about the housing sector and the real estate sector in, in the Western economies. But this sounds like it's uh, almost some extra strong steroids, the, the Chinese uh, economy, Leilani. Mm. It does sound like it's on steroids, as does, I mean, I, it makes me think about the inequality that must exist in China, because I know that huge portions of the population are living in deplorable housing conditions in what I think are called villages, like urban villages. And obviously those households can't afford to invest in real estate or can't afford to purchase uh, fancy homes in these uh, skyscrapers. So if you've got 60 to 90 million vacant homes, that suggests that there's some segment of the population that can invest and... Um, or that there's overproduction f at the wrong level. In other words, things are being produced that actually don't meet the need of people at the lower end of the economic spectrum. That's Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. I, the average housing price uh, in, in, as a multiple of, of, how, of annual household income in Beijing and Shanghai is about 25. So 25 times uh, what they would earn in, earn in a year to buy, to, uh, for, for an apartment, and that compares to, I think it's something like eight times in London and maybe seven times in New York, which are cities that obviously aren't known for cheap prices. So we're talking about extremely expensive apartments in the cities. As you say, a very large portion of the population is in substandard housing. We have uh, the world's largest internal migrant population of almost 300 million people. And they, for a variety of historical reasons, and reasons today uh, are really treated as second-class citizens. And as you point out, yes, there's a lot of housing out there and, and it's not accessible to them in almost all cases. Mm. But then the crisis right now is not about these 300 million um, migrant workers in, in China. It's about the middle class who are sitting with their investments and about to lose them. And then also in the bigger part of the, the business community and, and the government, I guess, if ever, ever grand can't pay their bills. It must be... That's a, absolutely true, yeah. So, I mean, Evergrande, I, probably, I think by most estimates, is China's second largest real estate company. As you said, they have you know, hundreds of projects around the country that are half, um, half built. Um, the way it works in China is they take the... They take the payment up front. So believe it or not, you'll you'll buy an apartment that's not going to actually be built for the next three years. So you have, you know, huge numbers of Chinese people that have paid for apartments that don't have them yet that are now afraid that if Evergrande goes bust, they'll never get them. Uh, Evergrande is you know owes three hundred billion dollars. Uh, a, a much smaller portion of that, about twenty billion, is to overseas creditors. So the real challenge. The people that are really stand to lose are are the Chinese people if Evergrande uh, uh, does go bust. Three hundred billion dollars. I I stopped have any 
feeling of how much money that is, but I guess it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> oh, very yeah. much. So. And I think of that, <laughs> something like forty billion is foreign foreign investment. I don't know who exactly. I had heard that BlackRock, for example, one of our friends friends on this show, so called friends on the, our show, a uh, big private equity uh, firm, uh, was one of the foreign investors, but there must be many more at forty forty billion dollars is a lot of money. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah, it is. It's it's maybe maybe twenty billion, but it's it's a lot of money. And I think BlackRock is one, and some of the other sort of the usual suspects. I think a lot of the um, big uh, finance houses, global finance houses mm -hmm. that are involved in property are invested in China. Um, so I mean, that's why we saw a global sell off on markets, um, in part because of that exposure by big uh, multinationals. But even more so, I would say the sell off was because of a, of the very real fear that uh, if Evergrande went bust and the larger real estate real estate sector, and it's not just Evergrande, um, started started seeing more and more bankruptcies, that would hit the Chinese economy. Once the Chinese economy has a major downturn, that has a real global impact beyond just these uh, international uh, you know financial companies. So sh should we be worried, or how, how do you see it? So. I mean, actually, the latest news, I think on Friday evening, uh, Evergrande announced through a filing to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange where they're listed that they uh, were in fear, that they were basically afraid they weren't going to, they were going to default. Um, and uh, what happened very quickly was the Guangdong government, which is the provincial government where Evergrande is based down in the south of the country near Hong Kong, uh, immediately issued a statement saying, we are in consultation with Evergrande, and we're going to try to um, work with them on risk and, and make sure operations continue as normal. So this just uh, is a reminder of the degree to which the Chinese government, both the provincial government and, and the central government in Beijing, is worried about the fate of Evergrande and the fate of the larger real estate sector. So I think that the short answer is we don't need to worry yet. China has so much riding on uh, the continued growth of the real estate sector uh, that they are, are, they're not going to let such a high profile company implode in a way that would hurt the Chinese economy uh, very, very badly. I'm, I'm interested in the government's response to this Evergrande situation because, you know, I don't know that much about China. I come, I read the news like anyone else, and I keep seeing references to the president's commitment to a common prosperity and even a slogan that houses are for living in, not for speculation. Um, so I'm wondering, I think those are interesting concepts there, the idea of common prosperity um, and the idea that houses aren't for speculation. I mean, those are things that actually resonate with me as a human rights lawyer uh, and advocate. Um, has this translated into anything from the government side in terms of how they're dealing with Evergrande? Well, I would say that, I mean, there's really two major reasons why they, they're trying to solve the issues of Evergrande. And one is the one I already mentioned, which is the excessive debt levels, which potentially is destabilizing for the whole economy, um, particularly if, if these big companies like Evergrande start going bankrupt. Uh, but the other one is the one you just you just pointed to, which is what, what Xi Jinping does indeed call common prosperity. And this, uh, which in its simplest form is an effort to try to make the economy fairer and deal with some of these extremes of, of in inequality that are now uh, very, very much alive and, and becoming more severe in the Chinese economy. Housing um, is uh, one of what the Chinese government likes to refer to as the three big mountains. And these three big mountains is housing, uh, education costs, and also healthcare costs. And they are seen, and, and, and indeed the government is right, as contributing to these issues, these, the problem with inequality. So I think, uh, yes, I mean, I think there is a, uh, an equally important motivation by Beijing, which is to try to uh, bring down housing prices and uh, uh, along with this, this very real debt mm. issue. Hmm. Because I, from, I, I'm starting to think about the parallels to, I mean, the the great financial crisis here in 2008 in, in and you, I mean where you're sitting with a lot of normal people investing buying one or two or three apartments putting their savings there and then you, of course you have this big big scale big operators that are 
the, the ones who can make a deal with the government when there, there is a crisis, which, I mean, the American government and many governments around the world helped their big banks and financial institutions to, to get out of it in some ways. But they didn't really help the small people when they, when and the ordinary people, when when so in the U.S., like 30 million people lost their homes. Uh, do you think this is something that can happen in China also? Because if if the if the value drops of of the housing market, it will mean a lot for those ordinary people who had invested. I think there's a the the, the Chinese government uh, is facing this great conundrum because. It, Really, since the global financial crisis in 2009, they have moved to this economic model, which is primarily driven by greater and greater investment, some 45 percent of, of GDP. And a very large portion of that, maybe a third of that, is real estate investment. So the economy rises and falls with the real estate market, and they know that. So uh, they do want to bring down prices. They realize that this growing inequality, wealth inequality, is potentially socially destabilizing. Uh, people are very upset about it. Um, uh, but they also uh, yeah, are in this very difficult situation. Uh, if they uh, uh, crack down too hard on real estate and try to bring down prices too much, it's going to hurt the overall economy. That will hurt the standing of the, the leadership, the Chinese Communist Party. And of course, that will hurt the people as well. So they want to bring down prices. They want to deleverage and bring down debt, but on the other hand, if they if they do it too quickly, they're going to they're going to actually hurt the economy and hurt the people as well. Which is the same. I mean, in, I mean, in my own country, Sweden, uh, we have the highest debt per per per, per person in uh, in in uh, housing costs, for example. So I mean, everybody knows that this is not a sound situation, and that at some moment, if the if the prices go down, a lot of normal people will will lose a lot so there is a, a lot of stress connected to this and of course that's um, so the governments have it's hard for them to move yes and I, one other thing i would just add is one of the glaring policy steps that they should have taken years ago and they've been talking about over a decade is to institute a property tax um and they talk about you know housing is for living and not for speculation. Well, one way to fix that in the in the real situation in China is to put a property tax on, so so people decide this isn't such a great speculative investment. Um, but they don't want to do that. I mean, they they they, they want to do that, but they they've been res there's been great resistance, and part of it is probably average people who don't who aren't used to paying a property tax. But even more so, I would say it's elite Chinese, many of them government officials themselves, who own in some cases. You know, it's not uncommon for a government official to have 15 different apartments in cities around the country. And not only do they not want to pay tax on that, they also don't want the, the, that, that fact exposed publicly that they, that they have so much wealth in housing. So uh, the government's been talking about it forever. Xi Jinping, the general secretary of the, of, of, of the Communist Party, just again mentioned uh, the, that China should move forward on a property tax. But until today, it's really just two pilot programs in the cities of Shanghai and a big western city of Chongqing. Um, and they, uh, there's been signs recently that they're, that they're sort of backpedaling on that, on that plan to institute a property tax. Yeah, I read that, they're, that they were contemplating this property tax, and I, I was surprised. What? So much property there and no property taxes? It's pretty wild. Um, but one of the things I don't understand, Dexter, or maybe you can um, help elucidate, um, isn't it the case that the government themselves contributed to Evergrande's woes? I mean, didn't they make... So, you know, I come at this as a human rights lawyer. You've got to remember that. But I, I recall reading that um, money became more expensive and is more expensive now in China than it was. In other words, it was more expensive to borrow. And that the government was looking at regulations and maybe has passed them, I don't know, to make it more difficult to borrow. In other words, if you haven't paid off your debt, you're not going to be able to borrow, for example, is one of the regs that I had heard was being discussed. So is it the case that they kind of brought Evergrande to their knees and, and, and now are in the position of trying to figure out, okay, we brought them to their knees, but we also believe in common prosperity and we need to save people from economic ruin? Is, am I reading that right? Yeah, no, uh, you are. I, the 
you know, the situation they're facing today with Evergrande almost bankrupt and many other property developers very much is of their own making. They, I think it was last summer, uh, a, a year ago this summer, uh, they instituted tight new restrictions on, on credit. And in, as you say, they made it much more difficult to borrow if you were already had, already had high debt levels. And this isn't, they, 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 in their policies, they often like to number things. This is actually another uh, trio. They call it the three red lines. And the three red lines was a policy instituted to try to deal with uh, the overheated property sector. And it was very much, in, you know, very much a government policy. And it very much brought China's real estate sector to where it is today. Uh, and yes, now they, they uh, you know, this year, property prices are going to still grow, I think just barely, maybe by a couple percentage points after probably twice that, at least let the previous year in 2020. Next year, the first half, most uh, people that watch the property market are expecting them to fall. And so uh, on the one hand, this meets the goal of the Chinese government to try to bring down some of the frothiness and reduce the, the cost that your average Chinese has to pay to buy a place. But on the other hand, um, again, it has real economic implications. So they're really between, you know, between the proverbial rock and the hard place. They want to cool this down. They know long term that the leverage the, the, uh, in the economy is not sustainable. Uh, and the real estate market, again, is the most leveraged part of all industries in China. But uh, on the other hand, they don't want to see the economy really slow. And they particularly, by the way, don't want to see it slow in the run up to one of their very most important uh, political meetings, which is the every, every five year party Congress of the Communist Party, which happens next fall. That one's particularly important because Xi Jinping has made it very clear that he's going to break with precedent and stay on as leader of China for more than a, the, the typical 10 years. So. They do not want the economy to tank before next October. <laughs> okay, let's see what I happens. I mean, it's, it's. I mean, China has always been a mystery. Maybe not as much for you as for us, but <laughs> because you've been there for for so many years. But I mean, it, it's an extreme radical capitalism in some way, and or in many ways. Um, and then you have the Communist Party and the state. So, I mean, we also in the West have a big problem with a, an extreme capitalism that is creating these big divides in our societies. It's, I mean, the same thing that they are in some ways are also up against right now. But do you think that this f fact that there is a very strong state that can just do what they want, can, can they solve things better in China? Can they get out of this? They can make big dramatic moves and they can order, you know, the banking system is almost 100% state owned. They can tell banks, uh, you know, we don't want these property companies to default. Actually, we decided that the deleveraging push has gone too far. Loosen up the spigots and lend them more money. So they have these abilities that we certainly don't have in, uh, in, other, in many other countries around the world. Um, uh, but they, uh, but but I think long term it doesn't solve this problem again of of this conundrum of uh, becoming uh, the economy becoming so reliant on investment, which has to do with the fact that it's st so state run and um, and you know trying to trying to create a more sustainable. They want a more household consumption driven economy. So uh, most of the economy is still, again driven by investment, as I said, a lot of that through lending by state banks. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the households don't typically have enough money, in part because of the vast inequalities, wealth and income inequalities. So you've got a large proportion of the people, um, as the Premier Li Keqiang said last year, famously or infamously, they have 600 million people uh, that live on uh, 1,000 renminbi a month, which is about less than $160 a month. So they have a very large number of poor people as well. Um, so that's, uh, so I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I, I, I think that they can, they, can, they can take moves, they can make dramatic moves, for example, to save a company like Evergrande, but can they actually deal with these longer, longer term issues and imbalances in the economy? It, that's not mm. so clear. Yeah, I like that answer, Dexter. I mean, my, my work is to find um, ways that are out there 
uh, to tame capitalism. I mean, that's what I've been trying to say. I say, you know, capitalism is okay, but capitalism on steroids, as Frederick might say, um, is problematic in the area of housing because it's creating this unaffordability that we're seeing everywhere around the world, including in China. So when I got onto Evergrande and started reading, I was like, okay, well, this is interesting because here you have a state government saying this is this is out of control and we're going to try to tame this beast um and so i take your point that this might not solve all of the economic challenges facing a country like china but i think it it still allows me to grab the china example to say look states can move in and do things to protect people from the absurdities of capitalism i don't know I think that's fair to say. Um, I to get a little bit into the weeds on the Chinese example, however, it, you know, it is, if you will, ster- uh, capitalism on steroids. But it has grafted onto it some very old Maoist era policies, which actually are at the heart of the inequality we see in China today. And one big one is I mentioned earlier the the, the almost three hundred million do- three hundred million migrants in the country. Um, that has a lot, they're, they're very much second class status in the cities. And you mentioned living in these shanty towns, which is, which is very much the reality for a lot of them. It has to do with the fact that there's a, still a household registration system, something called the HUCO, which means that they, that, they are, that they don't get access to their social welfare, health care, education for their children, retirement pensions, and so on, where they work. So, so the, this, this, this is a, a policy that still dates back to the Mao era, 1953. Um, and, and the other big one, which is very relevant for the property market, is there's still a, what, the, what they call the dual land system. And the short version of that is uh, Chinese, as you probably know, don't have like a freehold ownership of their land. They have long-term uh, use rights. And in the cities, uh, officially, Property is owned by the state. In the countryside, it's owned by the collective, which is relates back to the, the communes. But, but setting that aside, more importantly, the reality is people in the cities are able to buy and sell their apartments with these subject to these 70-year leases, which are going to be which appear to be rolled over and, and that's going to go on smoothly. In the countryside, people don't have that same right. So there is there are a lot of people in the countryside, farmers, migrant workers who typically have a plot back in the countryside, might have a house on it. Um, they are not able to really monetize that land because uh, they, they just don't have that right. They, uh, in effect, rural land to be sold needs to go through the local governments. I'm, again, I'm getting a little into the weeds here, but in this, so, it, so in the cities, there's been this explosion of wealth we've seen in China. Um, we saw the top 1%, uh, this is research actually by Thomas Piketty, research that showed that the top 1% had 15% of total wealth, I think, back in 1995. That doubled to 30% of wealth uh, 20 years later, 2005, uh, 2015. And that, that, this, that's roughly equivalent to Russia. And the growth, the speed of the growth, which is very rapid in China, is also roughly equivalent to Russia. You know, so it's very, very unequal. And again, that has a whole lot to do with the housing system. So rural people, if they want to do something with their land, they basically sell it at a nominal price to local governments in the, in the countryside, who then turn around and sell it for multiples more and become very wealthy. And this is, by the way, become a key part of local government revenues. So local governments survive about a third of their revenues they live on is related to land sales. In the cities, by contrast, people are buying and selling apartments and becoming, in many cases, very, very wealthy. So, uh, so again, yes, China's been talking, you know, yes, China does make these, can make dramatic gestures to try to deal with inequality. If they were really serious about it, they would need to solve this problem of this dual distinction between urban and rural land. And that's very hard for them to do because rural governments rely on that. On that. Um, and there's much corruption involved in it and so on. Um, but that's what they really need to do if they want to uh, if they want to create a more equal mm-hmm. society, along with things like the property tax. Dexter, I've seen I've seen some documentaries and images of these kind of new built ghost cities around around China. And I guess that Evergrande is a part of that building those cities. Have Absolutely. you been to any of these places? I have. Yeah, um, I've been to a number of them. Um, How uh, is it? In- 
So the it, what's immediately obvious, well, maybe not immediately obvious, but what one realizes is that um, this is very much uh, part of a big money making money making scheme that involves, of course, local property developers um, and local city officials. And uh, because the property, the value of property has continually gone up, because they can get that land for next to nothing. By, through this, this, this process I just described, where they can basically rezone it, buy it for a nominal fee from the, or buy the, the, buy the use rights from, for a nominal fee from the local farmers or, or the migrants who might have had it, um, and then turn around and sell it for huge multiples. So you, th they'll develop these cities in order to make money. And so, uh, and the local governments are very much involved in this because they're the ones that have the right to rezone the land from agricultural to industrial, commercial, or residential use. So, yeah, so the first thing that really strikes you is there's nobody there. <laughs> they're, they're, they're vacant. They're very beautiful. Um, a huge amount of money has been put into building um, all sorts of buildings, not just residential, commercial, uh, you know, fancy new museums that are, that are supposed to be filled in schools. Um, but ultimately, it's all about, uh, you know, it's really but a money-making scheme. it's all empty. It's all by, empty. By, so yeah. you, you come to a, a big city, with no no people, it's like after the the bomb kind of yes. feeling, or what? It's very strange. So the one I went up to in Inner Mongolia, which is north of Beijing, uh, which is one of the more famous ones, um, they uh, the the only people they could convince to live there were uh, local government officials. So uh, or uh, they thought so, but a lot of the local government officials refused to move there. So. A very interesting experience you would see the the local they moved the city government there they moved all the functions of the city government and at the end of the day and i was there at the end of the day these big buses pull up outside the the, the local courthouse and in the local government offices and all the the local officials get in them and get on their buses to go back to the the city where they actually live which is the old city um uh which is a it's quite a sight and all the buses drive out and then the city is really a ghost town for the night because I've seen, I've seen a, a, quite an amazing documentary about actually Western young musicians and so on being invited in to, to perform, uh, you know, to make films. And, you know, when they had a kind of sales party of new apartments, oh. so they're like promoting these cities. So it's it, it really selling it with, uh, with music and Western faces and, and all this. But... So, I mean, when, when you talk then about what happened afterwards with all these ghost cities, how could the Chinese government let this happen? It's like in some way that they totally lost control of their own country. Because yeah, it's, the, the, it the, interesting, the interesting thing is, so as I said, I mean, some government officials, some wealthy people will have maybe a dozen apartments around the country. They want a couple in Beijing, a couple in Shanghai, one back in their hometown in the province. So so you have a situation where there's a lot of vacant apartments, obviously, as we we're discussing. Um, that doesn't necessarily matter if the people, if, if housing prices keep going up. They're seen as a repository of wealth for whomever owns them. And as long as the local governments continue to in some cases, seize land from local farmers and redevelop it and make money. And by the way, as I said a moment ago, uh, help pay the local. They, they do they, that money that they get from housing development also goes towards important things like paying local pensions, building schools, and so on. As long as that continues in this merry-go-round, everything's fine. And so. What the Chinese, I mean, it gets back to what the Chinese government is trying to do right now, which is deflate that leverage bubble and try to create an economy that long term is more sustainable, more reliant on spending power of the people and less on investment, less on real estate. Um, that's where it becomes a problem because they want to they want to deflate the property values to a degree, become more affordable. Uh, they want to wean the economy and, and off to a degree off its reliance on ever more uh, building. Uh, but at the same time, they can't go too far or they'll, they'll actually you know, derail the economy and people will see the values that they put into these apartments uh, lost overnight. In my film Push, where Leilani is featured, uh, we meet with a leading sociologist, uh, Saskia Sassen, in London. And she talks about, I mean, why are there's all these empty buildings, also in New York, you know, empty apartments. And she explains that it's 
they are assets in a financial game. So it doesn't really matter if somebody lives there or not. But of course, how long can this run, you know, with, with a lot of empty assets? I mean, at some point, if you see a big city out in, in, in the Chinese desert and nobody lives there, is that asset still worth yeah. something? I mean, it's a bit strange. I think it, it makes my head go a bit fuzzy. I can't, you know, one can imagine the value of an empty condo building in the heart of Manhattan. But, I mean, I've been to similar ghost areas in Egypt, for example, uh, where they are just simply depositories for cash, investment, uh, pen it's personal pension fund, that kind of thing. And it's in the middle of the desert, nothing there, no vibrancy, no city, nothing to give it value beyond the land that it's uh, on which it sits. It's just, it's a, it's a bit mind boggling. To me, it's like such a stark representation of, of the capitalism that we're living with right now. And that, as Frederick said, that governments have allowed, have invited in, allowed this to happen. It, I, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's, it is astonishing. And the place I just mentioned in Inner Mongolia is in, really in the middle of nowhere, out on this, it's not desert, it's steppe, but there's nothing there, to, there's no reason to have a right. city there. Um, and they have a perfectly fine city right. already, uh, which is where people still want to live. Do you think people ever will come and live there? Well, the um, the hope is that, they, that they'll fill them up. And I mean, the, the, the example that people bring up is, you know, way back decades ago, they started to build you know, a vast new city across the river in Shanghai called Pudong. And uh, people said, this is a white elephant, they're crazy. And now it's a vibrant, you know, new, very important part of one of the most important vibrant cities in China. But that was right next door to Shanghai with, his, you know, centuries of, of, of history as a vibrant city and ec economically growing. Um, and this is something different, I think, now. The other thing that is a real worry for China is if you look at the getting into the economics of it, if you look at the productivity of the economy, it's come down dramatically. So basically that means that, that for every dollar that they put in, whether it's lent by a state bank and often put into building a new apartment block, which might be empty, they're getting, you know, to use the cliche, less bang for their buck. So the GDP uh, effect of, or the, the amount of GDP they get out of the investment keeps going down. And they, they know that. So 10 years ago, they could loan a certain amount of money and the economy would grow by a certain amount. Now, that's not the case anymore. They need to loan you know, several times as much money just to get the economy to, 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 to basically remain stable and not slow. And that's because of you know, this declining return on investments. That's because ultimately they've built too many things that aren't really economically um, mm -hmm. uh, productive. And so... Uh, so this is, this is a real concern of the government. And they're, they're aware of this in China, but they haven't figured out a, a solution to so it. So extreme capitalism killed communism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or whatever it is. I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not too happy with labels, but I mean, it's, but it's, mm. a, it's, it's a bit weird. So to, to sum up this, I mean, it's been amazing to have you here with all mm -hmm. your knowledge. And, and I hope a lot of people will read your book, The Myth of the Chinese Capitalism, because I think you're touching upon a lot of these things here. Uh, so where, where, where shall we see China go now the, the, coming, the coming years? I think, like Lalani was saying, I mean, there, was, there were hopeful signs in this push for common prosperity. And this, you know, this very openly stated awareness by the leadership that the growing inequality is a problem. But if we look at sort of the policies that they've taken, I mean, bringing down the real estate sector is important and needed, it's just very difficult. Uh, so that's a good thing. But as I said earlier, uh, if you look elsewhere, whether it's a property tax, they don't have an inheritance tax, actually. Um, if you look at the reform of these legacy policies I mentioned, the household registration and the dual land system, they're really making very little progress. So they, I, I'm concerned that the um, effort to, trying to create a more equal society uh, mm. will not succeed simply because they're, they're not taking the proper steps. Yeah, interestingly, if you look at China's response during COVID, and of course, now they've done so much better at, at uh, controlling it and keeping the economy running. But if you look at when they were suffering more in the first quarter of last year and so on, uh, 
they really did not do, if you look, you know, uh, United States, you know, hyper capitalist country by most accounts, there's been major wealth transfers to low income people. You know, people, there's been all these, you know, benefits from the government to try to, you know, the, all these livelihood checks and so on to try to keep the economy afloat. China did not do that all, almost virtually at all. Instead, what they did is cut taxes for, for, for small enterprises and other companies in China, I guess with the logic that this would trickle down into wages and they'd hire more workers and so on. But this is typically what China does, you know, despite its communist roots. They are very cautious about actually doing and taking policies that would clearly redistribute wealth. Uh, Xi Jinping, in a recent speech, warned of the dangers of what he called welfareism. So he's talking about common <laughs> prosperity. He's also saying welfareism, just, just you know, the worst, I mean, the, the absolute stereotype of, 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 of a capitalist saying, you know, the dangers of welfareism and uh, providing so much support that people don't want to work. And he actually said this in a speech. Wow. Um, so, I, so I think there's a real, uh, uh, there's, a mis there's, a, there's a gap between some of the rhetoric we hear from them mm -hmm. and their actual mm -hmm. policies. And then one other thing I just say quickly, uh, which we haven't talked about, but which is a huge issue is the aging population. You know, the fact that they, um, uh, if the you know, the workforce is shrinking, uh, there's huge new costs for families and local governments to pay for elderly people. And this is going to be a big economic drag as well. And this is something that um, is really, a, a pro, most, most demographers think it's going to be impossible for China to reverse this trend, which is a rapidly aging population at a, at a, at a, at a point when China's not a very wealthy country what other people have referred to as getting old before it gets rich. Um, and this is something that's going to be a big drag on the economy. And frankly, it makes things like dealing with the real estate sector even more complicated going forward. It's so interesting because, I mean, when you, the debate and the view on China, I mean, in the political debate in Sweden or the US or wherever, it's like we should, the Chinese are coming is basically what the, the signal is in the media. But no, you are actually des describing um, a weaker Struggle. China uh, that are a little struck, like st stuck with its own huge mm -hmm. problems. Absolutely. I mean, I've been a skeptic on this this thing that investment banks, global investment banks, have repeated like a mantra about how China is you know is is poised within a decade to overtake the U.S. as the world's largest GDP. There's plenty of reasons to think that might actually never happen because of these issues, these core challenges they face. Even if China does exceed the U.S., it's also possible that they that this uh, and that that it might fall back in terms of GDP. And and finally, the third point. <laughs> You know, so what if the GDP exceeds the U.S.? They have these huge problems with inequality, with people. They, you know, they announced that they solved the problem of extreme poverty, which perhaps they have. Uh, they've done a very good job in dealing with some of the extreme poverty issues. But there's still huge numbers, 600 million people at least, according to the premier, that are living uh, in, in near poverty. And so these are all things that uh, could indeed, I think, uh, uh, make China. I, I, I think. I think you're right. I think there's a there's there are fears in this sense that China's poised to take over the world, and I don't think that's mm. what's coming at all. Yeah. Thank you. And and GDP is also such a sloppy way of describing because if the G yes. GDP covers building ghost cities, exactly. What's exactly. the point? Non what, what's the productivity Absolutely. of building a ghost yeah. city? So yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And and of course masks. It doesn't deal with these fast inequalities which are getting which are becoming more extreme mm. also in the u.s yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah oh absolutely absolutely and yes. also in sweden and in brazil where i'm right now and in that way frederick it it does mirror what you were talking about with the global financial crisis where the, i mean china has looks like they are moving in the direction of aiding evergrand but they're not dealing with the 600 million people living in poverty, even if it's not extreme poverty. They're not rushing to their aid, is what Dexter seems to be saying. So uh, They are not. Yeah, and probably not even to the middle class stuck in this kind of investment schemes because they are saving the big, mm. the big guys. I think this is too often. Uh, most of the time is the case, unfortunately. Well, 
Thank you very much for for uh, talking to us from uh, snowy Montana. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been well, a thank you. It's a <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet people with so deep knowledge, and we, we come out and feel that we know more. And I hope our listeners also like that because we we have a plan to continue doing this podcast, Lena. We're gonna try. We're gonna try. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a balance because we are we. I mean, we we don't make any money on this podcast. I I'm busy with a new film project and you are running the shift the global director of the shift and you are always extremely busy but anyway if and so if people want to support the podcast do you have any suggestions I do. they can support by going to patreon.com and looking for pushback talks and donating a little money every month doesn't have to be much a little bit goes a long way and also, if you want to help us, you can also tell your friends about the, the podcast and tweet about it on yes. Facebook. We're and, looking for know, our 122nd whatever. country. <laughs> Dexter, thank you very much for being on Pushback Talks. Leilani, we will talk soon and uh, enjoy the holidays if, if there will be any for you. But I hope so. Oh, yes. There's always holidays. Thanks so much, Dexter. I learned a ton. It was great to have you. Thanks uh, both to both of you. Uh, uh, very much enjoyed the conversation and the opportunity to talk about China and <laughs> real estate and, and the future. Great. That's great. Thank you very much. It's a wrap, folks, of season three of Pushback Talks. We're taking a holiday break but Frederick and I will certainly be back in the new year to keep alive the conversation about cities, finance, housing, and human rights. If you have any suggestions for a topic or guest for next season, send us a message on Twitter or email us at info at maketheshift.org. As always, if you'd like to quantify your love for Pushback Talks, you can do so by becoming a patron. Visit patreon.com forward slash pushback talks to sign up. And don't forget to review the podcast wherever you listen in. So before I sign off, on behalf of me and Frederick, a big thanks to all of our listeners from 122 countries across the planet. We'll see you next year.